The Heinemann Podcast is a production of Heinemann Publishing. Heinemann is a provider of resources written by real teachers for real classrooms. Heinemann values teachers as decision makers and students as curious learners. Discover the path to lifelong professional learning at Heinemann.com. Heinemann, dedicated to teachers. I'm Brett from Heinemann. On today's podcast, putting the fun back into writing. Ralph Fletcher says, nothing helps writers grow like practice, but not just any kind of practice will do. You've got to bring the joy. In his new book, Joywrite, Ralph shares the whys and the how of giving students time and autonomy for the playful, low-stakes writing that leads to surprising high-level growth. Ralph talks about how the element of fun has disappeared from classrooms. So when my colleague Josh sat down with him, he asked why. When you sit down with a bunch of, of children and they begin to write, I'm always interested in what they're going to be coming up with. I mean, we forget that writing process had its roots with the Romantic philosophers, going back to Rousseau. And Rousseau and those philosophers were really interested in children, not as unformed adults, but as just different. Like, what are they doing? What are they, what are they going to say? How are they going to act? And for me, what are they going to write? And so it's wonderful to see what kids are going to write and how they express themselves, the quirky things that they do. Um, that's fun for me, and it's fun for them to be able to express themselves. I think that nowadays in uh, the more academic writing world, it's more about um, checking off a list of things that the genre expects. So it's less about that, and it's more about um, compliance, frankly. Um, that's not that much fun. Um, and I understand that there's a, there's a balance. You know, we do want to enrich what kids can do, and we want to show them. And it's not just all writing in a vacuum. But I think that, um, you know, some of the things that we really need to be uh, advocating for and celebrating in writing, things like uh, voice in writing. I mean, voice, which is the, the unique way children express themselves um, and, and how it's different. You know, if you end up with a whole stack of uh, essays uh, or argumentation and they're all pretty much the same, well... I don't think that's good writing. I mean, and, and I have to say that I see an awful lot of formulaic writing as I go around the country. Um, and I don't think that's good writing. I don't want to read that. I don't want to read the same piece over and over and over again. Um, I have a little story about that, by the way. Uh, I got a letter um, from a classroom that had read my, my novel, Fig Pudding. And, you know, I started reading the letters and I noticed, I started to notice after about the fourth or fifth one that they all followed the same kind of format. Um, I like this part. I connected with this part in the second paragraph and, and then some questions at the end. And so I'm like, they, they started to sound awful familiar. And the last letter attached to it was a fig pudding rubric. And I was like, oh my God, my book's been rubric. And a friend of mine said to me, well, that means you've really made it. Once they put a rubric, man, that means you've made it. Well, I don't want to be rubriced. I don't want those kids to be saying the same thing. And when you start to see letters like that, you realize it's not about the kids really saying what they want to say. They're following a format that's been given to them. Um, and it's not really authentic anymore. I mean, I'd like to know what the kids think and not following the format. Uh, so I think that that kind of thing is happening a lot um, in, in the writing classroom. One of the things that I say in, in Joyride is that, you know, once upon a time, writing workshop flourished because we had teachers who valued originality, passion, voice, and kids could take chances in their writing. And you know why? Because teachers were given space to take chances in their teaching. We could take risks ourselves, and therefore we could invite our kids to take those risks. It's hard to believe that we're going to have classrooms where kids can be taking chances and taking risks if teachers themselves aren't given that leeway. And so one of the things that I need, I'm really advocating is we've got to give teachers more um, space to do the things that they believe um, and, and what they really see those students need. Not what an expert says, reading some curricular map, but what their sense of their students tell them. At the heart of your new book is the idea of greenbelt writing. Can you talk a little bit about what greenbelt writing is? First of all, I think it's important to to realize that education, um, like everything else, has a lot of changes. Things come in, things go out. And if you're in education long enough, you are aware of things that come in and out of style. And I think that what's happened in the world of writing, I think the standards movement has made um, writing more academic, not just in high school, but really in middle school and also in elementary school. 
Um, you'll hear teachers talk about how um, what used to happen in first grade now gets pushed down to kindergarten. I think that as writing workshop has found more academic writing, some kids aren't doing that well in that environment. Um, some kids are fine with it, but some kids are finding it uh, constricting and confining. I'm making an analogy with what's happened in um, population growth. This is not a, a field that I'm an expert in, but I know enough about the fact that many communities have seen a lot of subdivisions and developed land and they've created uh, green spaces or green belts where um, they're kind of b uh, benign neglect spaces where nothing happens, that they're re allowed to remain wild. In the same way, in the writing classroom, a lot of curricular land has been chopped down. A lot of wildness has kind of been pulled out of the writing classroom. Even if we accept that that is the way it is, I think that teachers might consider creating uh, green belts, a writing green belt, a place where that wild writing could still exist and flourish. And I think that we'll find that a lot of times the kids that are not flourishing in the more constricted world of writing workshop can find their stride as writers in a writing green belt. One of the things that you, you know, that's a, a hallmark in this book is this idea of choice. Yes. So what makes choice so critical and not, I mean, even as you've alluded to here, this idea of we're doing per persuasive essays today so you can pick this topic or that topic, but we're all writing persuasive essays in this format. But what is what does real choice look like in writing and why is that so critical? You know, if you look at my recent books, the last four or five books, um, Boy Writers, uh, the book on making nonfiction from scratch, um, my books are about widening the circle and bringing more choice back into the writing classroom. So this is not just like something that I'm talking about in this book. This is like um, a theme uh, or campaign that I've been on for <laughs> for for a while. And um, you know, I think that um, choice is is very important. I think that we've created this big elaborate contraption. Uh, think about all the books that have been published by by Heinemann and, and other publishers about reading writing workshop. Mm -hmm. uh, probably hundreds of them. And um, it is a wonderful thing. Um, I believe in it. And I remind myself every day that choice is the, is the crank that turns the, 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 you know, the grinder. Um, without choice, the thing just stops and doesn't really um, flourish. It won't work. We, we think sometimes about choice in a limited way. Um, choice is not just a matter of uh, what to write about. Right. I mean, that's part of it. And I really think it's important that, that students can decide what they want to write about and choose topics that are passionate to them, that, that matter to them, that they're interested in. But also, um, choice includes how to write about something. How do you start? You know, do you start with sound effects? Are you going to start with some dialogue? Are you going to start by setting a kind of an ominous mood? That's something that the writer has to decide. Um, what words you're going to include? Is it going to be funny or snarky or serious? Um, there's a million different choices. And one of the things that I always say is that a writer is somebody who's making decisions. And I say that to kids in kindergarten all the way up to, to high school. A writer is somebody who makes decisions. So what decisions are you going to make today? And as, as I come around and confer with you, I'm going to be interested in seeing what you're deciding. That question is legitimate and, and, and um, ongoing and vibrant if kids really can make those decisions. Mm. But if they're following kind of like a, um, a format or following a, a heavy anchor text or, or a rubric where they really are sort of checking off the things that have to be in there, that's not a format, that's not a uh, environment that really encourages choice. Yeah. Um, and as I say in the book, by the way, uh, and, you know, and the teachers that I talked to were almost unanimous in agreeing with this, that I think that kids in elementary and middle school have a lot more choice in reading than they do in writing, which is really interesting because that switched around, you know, like many, many years, you know, 30 years ago, kids were given these very prescriptive things to read and they had more choice in writing, but they had to sort of follow these little, you know, SRA things. But nowadays, um, it seems to me that choice is really, um, as I said, disappearing in, in the writing classroom. Mm. So it, uh, for a teacher in the classroom tomorrow that maybe has a more scripted, structured writing program that they're being asked to do, what's something you would say to them? Hey, here's a way you can bring a little bit more of this joy, choice, into your classroom right away. I feel for those teachers because it's a real issue. Um, I was just speaking to a, 
a young woman were, uh, about this issue, she had said the similar thing. She said, I have to teach this way. I feel like uh, our curriculum follows this way. Um, I'm not a tenured teacher, so it's hard for me to really go against the, uh, the demands of the district. Um, first of all, I would say this, that the metaphor that I use in writing is, in a writing classroom, is like you have to get the flow of the writing going. If the writing's not, it's like a body of water. If the water's just sitting there, you can't do much with it. Once you get it flowing, you can redirect the flow. And so I really think that the way you get the water flowing is you give the kids choice and you make them feel comfortable enough to be taking risks. Now, teachers that have to follow a curriculum are finding, um, you know, sneaky and subversive ways, uh, or just like ways to bring more choice into it. So one thing I would say is that, um, you know, teachers are using the idea of free choice Fridays where they have a lot of choice on that one day of the week. It seems to be kind of a small green belt, but at least the kids uh, will have times where they can really cho choose what they want to write about. Also, a lot of teachers are using some version of the writer's notebook. And to me, the writer's notebook is all about choice. It's all about play. And it's all about um, the kids' own passions. And so maybe ask yourself, could I make a bigger space for the, writing, the writer's uh, notebook in the classroom? Because a lot of schools, in the way a lot of curriculum is laid out, uh, writer's notebook is prominent for the first couple of weeks, but then it sort of languishes a little bit. It sort of, you know, gets, it kind of goes in the background. But maybe there's a way to keep that thing alive during the year because that is a um, container that holds a lot of choice. And this is a little bit more uh, ambitious, but what about having uh, open cycles? We talk about this when Joanne Portalupi and I wrote Teaching the Qualities of Writing. Um, our idea would, there would be some genre focus in the fall and a genre focus in the spring, but um, there would be a time when um, there would be an open cycle where the students could decide for themselves what to write about, also what genre to put it in. So one of the things that you mentioned earlier was about the student, you know, for, for students, even when there's choice um, in a writing workshop, that sometimes you still have those students that are sitting there with the blank page. What would you say to teachers who are experiencing that, who have those students that have a harder time getting started or they're not sure how to coach them in getting started and they, they want to support those students to grow? Well, many teachers, um, I would guess almost every teacher who, who uh, works with, with young writers is going to have a reluctant writer or two. By the way, often that, that young writer is a boy, but not always, to be fair, but... Um, You've got a kid who just seems to be checked out, dis, dis, uh, disengaged. And I know there's no magic answer and every kid is uh, different, but I really think that the answer to that issue is to find out what that student really is passionate about, what he cares about, and invite him to choose to write about that. You know, oftentimes kids have a body of knowledge about something and it may be, it may seem obscure to us. Um, some of these like uh, fantasy cards, like magic or something, or it could be a video game. Um, but they, but they really know a lot about it. They know a lot more than we know about it. So to invite them to write about that and try not to be judgmental about it. I think sometimes in our head, we've got like, and I, even myself, I notice myself, I have like a hierarchy of like good topics and not so good topics and kind of like silly topics. You got to let go of that because I think a good writer can make anything interesting. Um, and so invite them to write about that. In Joyride, um, I have a chapter on the reluctant writer, and uh, we really take a look at how we can motivate my kids. One of the other things that you talk about in Joyride is the idea of what you call feral writing, which, which might be a topic that not everyone is as familiar with. Uh, wh how would you describe what feral writing is? Well, I like that word feral because um, if you look up the definition, a feral animal is an animal that was uh, domesticated and goes back to the wild. And I think, uh, unfortunately, a lot of the writing in the uh, writing workshop has become domesticated and needs to get some more wildness to it. In my book, I'm really advocating for um, uh, writing that's informal, because I think that's the way a lot of us use writing ourselves in our lives. If you, if you ask yourself the kind of writing that we're doing right, you know, every day, we make lists, we, t we jot notes, we're writing to a friend, we're making plans, um, you know, I would say like for most of us, 80% of the writing we do is not meant to be published or write out to the real world. And so I would argue that any kind of writing is valuable um, for young people to be doing. And so I think we want to teach kids uh, an unpretentious prose, encourage them to feel comfortable doing that, and 
embrace all the kinds of writing that they do, um, which includes their own collaborations with friends, um, fooling around in, in a sketchbook, um, you know, making notes, um, all that is writing. And the interesting thing is that in my research, one of the things I discovered was a lot of kids don't think of it as writing. So one of the things that we can do in terms of uh, how do we kind of encourage it is uh, we can sanction it. We can tell the kids that we recognize that they're doing it and that we do see it as writing because clearly all the conditions are there. There's audience, uh, there's, there's a response, you know, there are choices being made. I mean, it's, it's absolutely is writing. A lot of it's done at home too, by the way. It doesn't have to be done in school. Um, so a lot of the green belt writing can be done at, at home. One of the things teachers have asked me is like, well, Ralph, how do you respond to this kind of writing? Mm. Do we feel like we have to read it all? Do we have to like confer with it all? And the good news is no. <laughs> um, and again, I go back, the, when I think about this, I go back to how do communities um, treat these green spaces? Um, we don't really go out and try to improve it. We don't go out there and you know prune bushes. Um, in general, we know it's there. We recognize the sovereignty of that, those spaces. Uh, as a survivability for species that can't survive too much in neighborhoods. But basically, we leave it alone. We may have a little fence, a little warning to sort of say this area is is uh, is wild and sort of be careful. But basically, we don't do much. And I think the same thing that uh, is true for teachers responding to green belt writing. Recognize it, honor it, but celebrate it with, give it lots of benign neglect, leave it alone. Don't feel like you've got to come in there and confer with it. On the other hand, if a kid wants you to read something, um, and it's, but you can read it. Sometimes, of course, you get in the situations where the kid's written the great American novel, where you read this and you may have to be uh, tactful and say, you know, I'd love to read just like your favorite page. And so there's a way to respond to it um, and not have to read, you know, 50 pages of it. <laughs> Our thanks to Ralph for his time today. If you'd like to read a sample chapter on Greenbelt writing or learn more about Ralph's new book, Joywrite, or find out more about Ralph, be sure to check out Heineman.com. Be sure to also like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter and Instagram. That's all the time we have for today. Be sure to subscribe for more podcasts. And you can also get a daily teacher tip right on your phone directly from Heineman Authors by downloading the Heineman Teacher Tip app. That and more on Heineman.com. Thanks for listening.